I was at a conference in London early last year to give a talk on infidelity from an evolutionary perspective. And Candace Blake, my supervisor, told me she wanted to introduce me to someone. She said something like, you got to meet this guy. He's read a million words of Manosphere writing. And then she shot me a wide-eyed, tight-lipped smile. Did I hear her write a million words? I wasn't aware that there were a million words to read on the subject. The Manosphere is an online web of communities centered around men. This includes, in the main, five groups. That's pickup artists, if you remember them, men's rights activists, MGTOW, a male separatist movement, incels, who we've spoken about at length in the past, and the red pill community, which I think it's fair to say is where Andrew Tate and his brother got their big break. They certainly borrowed and rebranded their analogy to the Matrix, but I'm going to follow the lead of today's guest here and note that the Tates have distanced themselves verbally from the red pill as quote-unquote dorks. And even before that, they've always seemed, at least to me, to be embarrassed by the association. And honestly, I get it, right? People in and adjacent to these five groups say really negative things about me all the time. And instead of being insulted, I mainly feel embarrassed that they know who I am. Chris Williamson recently told me that me, him, and a few other public thinkers have been dubbed the intellectual manosphere by critics within the manosphere. He joked that if you're going to give us a name by which to dislike us, you shouldn't make it sound so cool. And intellectual manosphere does sound kind of cool if you take it out of the context of the usual meaning of manosphere. But I'm hoping the name won't stick because to start with, it's a misnomer. My audience has always been mostly women in terms of following, but especially in terms of viewership. And I don't know Chris's analytics, but my business partner went to a live event of his and told me, regardless of the online impression of Chris as a role model for young men, it was crowds of women waiting to hear the man speak. So, Womanosphere might be a less inaccurate name for our content. More importantly, though, I don't like the name because I don't like how associated I've become with these groups. Commenters occasionally ask me what my problem is with the Manosphere, and the quick answer is that I'm nothing like any of the people in it, except that I study some of the topics they claim expertise in. Here, I'll give an opportunity to everyone to get off the train, right? This episode is not family-friendly, and this intro is going to take a while because I have no plans to do more content on these groups, and in that spirit, I want to make sure nothing worth saying is left unsaid. And listening back to this interview, I realized that there's no point at which I made it explicitly clear why me and these groups don't get along. So, let's go through it. Men's rights activists, even the ones that are feminists, are agitated about political injustices that I genuinely have not noticed. I've never felt that being a man in any of the countries I've lived in has put me at a net disadvantage. And the fundamental project of pickup artists, that is, making dating into a skill and hobby, makes me cringe. As for the red pill, and the black pill, or incels, and MGTOW, well, <laughs> these groups are just too bloody hostile towards women in ways I'll get into. Now, I want to note up front that I have genuine sympathy for many of the followers of these last three ideologies in the sense that most of them seem to have had serious struggles with women and then fell into bleak internet rabbit holes off the back of that. Right, The members of these groups have often been dealt genuinely bad hands. Right, Divorce, persistent rejection, getting cheated on, difficult moments with their mothers, and so on. And it's not just the followers, right? Whenever I've found out about the backstories of the leaders of these groups, the stories have consistently made me sad. Almost all of these guys have had relational struggles in their youth, and that's a large part of why these three groups exist, right? They are built as a place for men who have had a rough time with women by men who have had a rough time with women. That said... Let's circle back to the hostility. The Manosphere, especially if we're talking about the last three communities I mentioned, is the best place to go online 
if you want to find real, overt sexism. For clarity, I'll break this into categories of critique. And while I speak only for myself with everything I say in this intro, the first three categories variously are, or will be, well documented by today's guest, who's going to expand on these further in the main show soon enough. First, these groups think of women as very different from men, which is to say, they think psychological sex differences are enormous. They exaggerate sex differences, such as sex differences in preferences for chastity or resources. They make up new ones, such as sex differences in capacity for romantic love. And when a sex difference is unfavorable to men, they'll routinely deny and even claim the reverse is true, such as in sex differences in empathy. And they'll do all of this on the back of no good evidence. Now, this whole impulse has never resonated with me. I grew up in a house filled with sisters. My social circles have always been mostly women. I've lived with many platonic female roommates, and currently do. And since puberty, I've always had some kind of, for lack of a better word, romantic relationship going. And throughout all of these familial, platonic, and romantic relationships, I never felt that much difference between guys and girls, right? I, I didn't really think about it and haven't really reflected on it much until now. I, I just saw them all as people. So this whole men are from Mars, women are from Venus approach to the world, talking about the minds and behaviors of women as if it's some grand mystery and as if they're a different species, it just completely misses the mark with me. It doesn't line up with how I've lived my life. More importantly, though, empirically, while there are several substantial sex differences, the rest are generally small where real, or on further investigation, not real at all. Now, this is something non-scientists, which is to say everyone in these groups, often miss. Right? They see statistically significant in a paper and think the word significant is meant to mean large. But a statistically significant difference can be quite tiny. For instance, you'll hear members of the Red Pill talk about sex differences in preferences for chastity and mates, right? You'd think that to men, this was the most important thing, and women either don't care or actually prefer to date men who are highly promiscuous. Well, there's been plenty of research on this topic, and while the differences they're describing are statistically significant, they're not actually that socially significant. It's not a super consistent sex difference, right? There are certainly some cultures where it really doesn't show up. And I've heard some researchers make note of individual men in their surveys who actively wrote in that chastity was undesirable, since that wasn't an option on the scale. But I do believe it's a real sex difference, right? I believe men are more likely to care about this sort of thing than women. It's just a small sex difference, much smaller than the whole red pill message of a woman cares about a man's future, a man cares about a woman's past, much smaller than that whole message the lies. For some perspective, this sex difference is about the same size as the sex difference in verbal abilities. Now, that's not my area, but it does seem there is a statistically significant sex difference where women, in general, on average, have better verbal abilities than men. But the difference there is so small, and anyone walking around the world can realize this, the difference is so small that knowing someone's sex gives you almost no additional information about that individual's verbal abilities. And so yeah, men do value chastity more, but knowing someone's sex similarly gives you almost no additional information about how much they value chastity. Many men care much less about this than the average woman. And all else being equal, most women would rather not date a highly promiscuous man. And it will surprise many listeners to hear that many of the men in these groups will have been surprised by the last couple of sentences. Now, there's one medium to large sex difference worth noting, which is in the greater male inclination towards multiple mating, right? Men are much more interested in pursuing uncommitted mating than women on average, across cultures, across nearly all methodologies and measurements I'm aware of. And this is ironic, because this one substantial sex difference is one I hear denied constantly by members of these groups, who grossly exaggerate how many women are engaging in extensive multiple mating, and to what degree. Second, 
The Manosphere generally, but especially these three groups, right? MGTOW, incels, red pill. They love making gross generalizations about women, right? Like they'll even make fun of people who point out the truth of individual differences in psychological diversity, right? They'll mock people who say, not all women are like that. Or as they say, now Walt. Well, mock all you want, but when we're talking about any psychological trait or behavior, Nawalt is almost always true, and Awalt is almost always false. That's the nature of psychology. We never get data that doesn't have a load of points off trend. This is even true about real sex differences that the manosphere correctly identifies. For instance, while it's true that women say they care more about resources than men care about resources when selecting a mate, some women genuinely don't care how much money you make. And I know this too intimately. Extrapolating from one's unique constellation of bad interactions with women to make or accept unflattering generalizations about all women, this, this is simple thinking. And, in a definitional way, bigotry. Third, as today's guest has done research documenting, members of these groups typically treat women as incredibly driven by nature, and treat men as largely rational agents. Now, I'm all for conversations about human nature, and I'm all for evolved psychology, and I'm all for evolved psychological sex differences, right? Anyone who follows me knows I'm a champion for the process of investigating these topics, but anyone Anyone who actually studies this stuff, again, that is to say, nobody in these groups, will tell you the following. Almost all humans can and do rise above their evolved psychology. For instance, to speak from my own special expertise, men and women have evolved psychological adaptations towards committing infidelity, right? We evolved to cheat. And yet many, maybe even most people, don't cheat. Right, they resist the urge. So when I hear these people talk about the evolved psychology of women, they sound like they're talking about forces akin to gravity. When even the scientists they cite, even those who believe these are innate and strong tendencies, would say they're more akin to a vegetarian's urge to eat meat. Which is to say, patently resistible. And while it's rarely discussed in these circles, men are just as influenced by their evolved psychology, and yet these groups are almost singularly focused on painting women with the tarred brush of nature. And finally, I find their vision of the good life unrelatable. As on all the points I've made so far, there are exceptions within groups, and for this next criticism, there are exceptions between groups, but for many of the red pillars and pickup artists in an aspirational way and black pillars in a jealous way, being a playboy is the highest level of self-actualization to them. Dating loads of girls, right? That's what success as a man looks like in their view. And anyone who disagrees with this is apparently lying. I've heard two prominent red pill influencers say that any man who could cheat without consequences would. And a common critique of me is actually useful here. Many people in the Manosphere, in my comment sections, of course, but more notably, Michael Sartain, have critiqued me for being, and I'm serious here, too pretty to know what I'm talking about. Right? They say I'm such a pretty boy that I haven't had to really struggle with women, and in not struggling, I haven't had the opportunity to understand women. Thanks, guys. But if you believe that, you should believe me when I say I'm not a playboy because I believe that lifestyle is insubstantial. And while we're on the point of superficiality, I find the way many of these men talk to and about women juvenile and objectifying even when it's not explicitly hostile. Even the quote-unquote thought leaders of the Manosphere have social media pages that are hard scrolls. I mean, we're talking about social media pages run by men old enough to be my father, posting pictures of half-dressed women younger than me. We're talking about middle-aged men ranting and whining about the sexual behavior of women now in college. Calling women names incessantly. Commenting on women's bodies incessantly. This is behavior that is beneath every man I look up to. 
and every person, every adult I speak to in real life. And haven't you noticed, all of the main podcasts in this space, intentionally or otherwise, serve as platforms for young women to promote their pornography. This is just a seedy part of the internet. So that's all to say that when I scroll through their feeds and see my name discussed, even as an enemy, it is unpleasant for me. To recap the last 13 minutes in a sentence, I don't like the Manosphere because the people in it, their concerns, their view of women, and their aspirations are not relatable to me in the slightest. And they exaggerate, misinterpret, and lie about the science I spend all day studying to paint women in a negative light. In fact, I'm so sick of this group that I've slow-balled releasing this episode partially to avoid more contact with this part of the internet. I've asked interviewers to stop asking me about these guys, and I'm sincerely hoping for this to be the last podcast I ever make related to them. My next guest is going to have nothing to do with these folks, and from here on out, I'm going to try to focus my energy on more complex ideas. Wouldn't that be nice? All that was really to say that when Candace told me that she wanted to introduce me to someone who is diligently sifting through the library of self-published books, Reddit posts, tweets, 4chan green texts, manifestos of spree killers and the like, working through all the PUA, MRA, MGTOW, red pill, incel stuff, hearing that, it's kind of like, it's kind of like hearing that someone's trying to work through all of Stalin's recorded letters, speeches, and the like. Right, like anywhere other than an academic conference, this would be quite unsettling right before an introduction. But at an academic conference, you just say, huh, cool. Let's, uh, let's hear what this person has to say. Now, you might be wondering what this sort of academic was doing at a conference with me, right? I'm an evolutionary scientist, and this was at last year's EBI, which is an unusual place to present on internet subcultures. But the reason he was there, and the reason we are here, is because the Manosphere has an unrequited love for evolutionary psychology. They cite the logic of EvPsych every chance they get, and they respond like jilted lovers every time evolutionary psychologists criticize them, which, lately, they often do. But when it comes to EvPsych, the Manosphere is full of amateurs. I've studied EvPsych in formal settings since I was a teenager and I've got relevant degrees from Boston University and the University of Oxford, and I'm working on a third degree in the area at the University of Melbourne. I've done peer review for multiple F-Psych papers, presented my own evolutionary research at a couple of conferences, and I've done two studies, one under review, one in the write-up phase, that most people would label as evolutionary psychology, even if that's not quite the way I think about things. And so, it's not that I am necessarily an evolutionary psychologist per se, but I really do understand EvPsych much better than anyone in the Manosphere. And so, if I listen to more than five minutes of these guys, or read a page of their blogs or books or essays, my brain will start saying, hang on, that's not consistent with broader literature. Given that they think of EvPsych as the foundation of many of their beliefs, it should surprise them that there's not one evolutionary psychologist who is part of the Manosphere. That is to say, every one these guys cite as a source for their beliefs, in a broad sense, disagrees with their beliefs. And that observation was first pointed out to me by Alexander from Date Psych, who I hear has also been labeled as <laughs> intellectual manosphere, for what it's worth. Now, I can't spend an hour fact-checking the Manosphere. It's a huge movement with diverse beliefs, and there are too many messes to clean up. But I think if only to make a point about the way they think, it's worth going over a couple of widespread misunderstandings in my area of expertise. First, extra pair paternity rates, or cuckoldry rates, the percentage of babies where you are not the father. I've heard Manosphere pundits from multiple subgroups, claim publicly that human extra pair paternity in the West is around 30%. Right? They believe that 30% of babies come from covert affairs by women who have tricked their husband or boyfriend into raising that baby. 
I've heard higher, but I'll be fair here and choose the least unhinged number, 30%. 30%? One in three? Look to your left, look to your right, one of you has a dad that's not your dad? Are you kidding me? The guys who believe this cite the revealed rates of paternity fraud in cases where paternity has been disputed and a test has been requested. Which is like trying to estimate the incidence of car crashes by surveying cars at an auto shop. The men are already suspicious enough to pay for the test. Of course the rates are high in these samples. In large Western samples, without this selection bias, paternity fraud is consistently less than 3%. And to be clear, 3% would be a high estimate. I'm being very generous here. Even at conferences and in classrooms among people like myself who think extra pair paternity is a significant factor in human evolution, you'd almost never hear someone put the estimate that high. And that's still a tenth of what these guys say. They're off by an order of magnitude. Another example. You'll hear many Manosphere blokes, especially red pill guys, claim that men peak in their sexual market value, that's their word for mate value, in their late 30s, while women, for their part, peak in desirability in their early 20s. Again, this is a widespread belief, but not a universal one, so if you're a card-carrying Manosphere member listening and you think, well, I, I don't believe that, I'm not talking about you. And here I'll make a quick relevant side note about who I'm talking about here. Rolo Tomasi, the godfather of the red pill, has critiqued me for not specifying exactly who I'm criticizing when I refer to those red pill guys. Or I think he was critiquing me. He didn't specify. He's called me out elsewhere, in any case. Now, I've been trying not to mention specific names in an effort to focus on ideas, not people. Because none of this is personal for me, truly. But fair enough, Rolo. Here I'm talking about you. You've written that men peak at 38, and women peak around 23. And you doubled down on these estimates this year on Twitter in a series of tweets. So I'm fairly sure your brain actually believes these numbers and has believed them for ages. Again, this is not personal. I just care about facts. But I'm happy to say your name when fact-checking you, even if I'm sincerely surprised you want me to. Anyway, the standard Manosphere estimate of what age a woman's interest for men peaks is quite reasonable. In my part of academia, it's pretty widely accepted. But the red pill meme that men peak in mate value or sexual market value 15 years later is an old man's fantasy. Nobody I know of who does sex research believes anything like this. Women in their early 20s. That is to say, as Manosphere blokes would probably agree, women at their peak selective power almost never select men that old. If you ask young women what they want in surveys, they usually say they want a relatively small age gap, generally less than four years. And if you look at young women's filters on dating apps, they typically filter out men over 30. And if you look at what women do in real life, they generally pair up with men two to four years older than themselves. And this is across data sets, across the countries where they are freest to choose who they mate with. And for what it's worth, it's not because men more than four years older than them don't want them. It's that they're rejecting those older men for their younger counterparts. In other words, the women with the most power to choose who they want women in their early 20s, are generally choosing men in their mid to late 20s, not even 30s, and certainly not late 30s. And funnily enough, in OkCupid's data, women's physical attraction to slightly older men, which I mentioned, reduces around 30. So 38 is going to be too old for many women in their 30s. Women peak at some point in their early 20s on average and men peak a few, maybe even several, years after that. Ironically, Rolo, if you're still listening, in early January you tweeted a graph from OkCupid that showed male desirability peaking at about 26, 12 years younger than your estimate. I think you misread the graph, as you tweeted it, in a thread that was supposed to support your men peak at 38 claim. 
This is as good a place as any to point out a key difference between scientists and ideologues. When the best available collection of evidence I'm aware of turns against a hypothesis I supported, I'm proud to say I changed my mind. Because for me, no emotions are involved here. So on simple factual questions, like what percent of purported fathers are not the biological father, or what age men peak in their desirability to women, the manosphere is not just slightly off base, but spectacularly wrong. Off by an order of magnitude. Off by a decade. I'm not exaggerating when I say I could spend all day cleaning up messes of this proportion and never finish. And the reason these groups make so many messes is because of the way they consider evidence. When a purported fact is negative towards women, they become the most wide-eyed, credulous students. Oh, the average 25-year-old woman has dozens of past partners? Thank you, male self-improvement podcast. Oh, looks are the only thing that women care about, and women love serial killers. Gosh, two major bummers. Thank you, incel wiki. Oh, women evolved to fall in love with their husband's murderer. Gosh, that's a very neat hypothesis. Thank you, rationalmail.com. See, they gleefully accept these purported findings and pretend they're inconvenient truths, all the while conspicuously delighting in them. And when a real finding paints women in a positive light, or men in a negative one, then, oh, then they pull out buzzwords they found Googling. Right, that's along with everything else they know. Now they want to talk about the replication crisis, or sample size, or academia's left-wing bias. And for those of us actually doing the research, these criticisms are hilarious because within academia, we're constantly accused of having a right-wing bias. And the biggest casualty of the replication crisis in our discipline is the periovulatory shift studies that the manosphere adores. But the most irritating thing about the whole black pill, red pill, MGTOW thing is that none of these movements achieve what they pretend to. And here, I'll speak to its adherents. You claim to stand against comforting lies in favor of cold truths. Right, that's the whole analogy to the Matrix movie that you're making. Whether you took the red pill or the black pill or whatever, you basically said, I want to know the truth no matter how much it hurts. But haven't you noticed that you've gone and swallowed a whole new set of pleasant delusions? Surely you can see how much of this is, as you might put it, cope. I'll give a few examples to help. Nice guys finish last. That's one common idea of a cold truth in the manosphere. Oh, how terrible. The reason women don't like me is because I'm too good of a person. See, reality is harsher than that. Research shows prosociality to be quite attractive to women. So, Either you're not as nice as you think, or your niceness wasn't enough to compensate for other shortcomings. Another supposedly harsh truth. Men peak in their late 30s, and women hit the wall at some point in their early 30s, right? So you'll get to be more desirable than all the women who reject you in your youth, one day. Oh, how awful. I'll get the last laugh, and I'm only getting better. See, reality is harsher than that. You're probably not aging like fine wine. And by the time you reach your late 30s, all those women who rejected you in your youth are probably just going to be married to someone else and never thinking of you. And it may really sound like a harsh truth to say that women never really love men. But even this is more comforting than reality, which is that many men are loved deeply, madly, truly by their girlfriends and wives. And if you haven't experienced that directly, it's not that it doesn't exist. It's that, so far, you've missed out. The pill you actually can't swallow is that many of the men you call blue-pilled are having wholesome, worthwhile romantic relationships with women. And it's not that they're simps missing out on the reality of their own relationships. It's that you're missing out on your own life. The coldest truth is that other people are warm. So, what to do? Well, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Getting jacked, fixing your hair, getting money, getting status, setting up a fun lifestyle, being picky about the sort of people you commit to, and then being cautious in your commitment, 
being aware that romantic partners can be duplicitous. These pieces of dating advice you'll hear across much of the manosphere are genuinely good. And in some cases, for some people, this advice is going to be more useful than the quote-unquote blue pill, be yourself, it's what's inside that counts narrative. But, oh my gosh, the bathwater is only holding you back. Whinging about women's sexual freedoms? Insisting women are solipsistic, emotionally manipulative creatures by nature? Believing every woman that shows love for you is just trying to get value out of you? Calling women foids? This is how you're going to fix your romantic life? Really, much of the manosphere claims to help men with women, but swallowing these pills is a superb way to repel women. The weird, geeky, pseudoscientific, misogynistic, bitter beliefs you pick up are the sorts of beliefs that push everyone worth spending time with away. So, I think that's all I want to say to the Manosphere, but there's much more to be said about them. Today's guest tells me the history of these groups, explains the differences and conflicts between them, discusses some of their widespread beliefs, including their widespread misconceptions, in much more detail and with much more of a theoretical focus than I have in this introduction. This conference where Candace introduced me to our guest was in London early last year, as I mentioned, and we spoke a few times at the conference and he came across as highly alert, keenly tuned in to the details of conversation, and broadly knowledgeable with a specialist knowledge of the manosphere that was immediately, evidently, encyclopedic. It's quite plausible to me that nobody on Earth knows more about the Manosphere than today's guest. And everything I'm saying here was especially well advertised in a conversation we recorded late last year for all of you today. Now, I pressed record for this podcast, and we actually got into, let's call it a 38-minute heated academic discussion about the extent of theoretical differences between evolutionary psychologists and human behavioral ecologists. And I decided to, for the sake of relevance, leave this out of the final cut. I say this only to give you a flavor for his personality. He is as passionate about this stuff as me. Unfortunately, at EB, we presented at conflicting sessions, so we couldn't see each other speak, There was a prize, a kind of competition, where there was a vote for best graduate student speaker, which I received the runner-up prize for, and the winner, funnily enough, was Louis Bichaud. Louis is a PhD student in anthropology at the University of Kent, whose work focuses on the manosphere, especially their use and misuse of science. I reached out to him before the show to quickly fact-check Candace's million-word claim. He sat down and did some calculations and said it was probably off by a factor of 10, and that he'd read closer to 10 million words of Manosphere content. And then he said that that's not that much. For what it's worth, that is 100 books, and I mean longer books, worth of words. And I think that calculation he did is from social media posts only. So, if that's not much, I don't know what would be a lot to Louis. Thank you to all the donors who made this show possible, and thank you to Louis, of course, for giving us his time. I hope you all enjoy listening to him as much as I did. Could you explain what the term manosphere actually refers to? So it refers to a collection of online, mostly online groups and communities that cater towards men, mostly in the West, and it offers spaces where some men can come and share their grievances, their experiences as men in in the contemporary society, usually with a very strong anti-feminist bent and oftentimes associated with dislike of women. There's no clear boundary of what belongs or does not belong to the manosphere, and there's no clear um, acceptance of, of boundaries, but there's agreement 
inside the groups as to what belongs to the manosphere or not. Would they identify themselves as part of the manosphere typically? So that's my criterion for classifying groups as belonging to the manosphere because some scholars will say, oh, gamers, geek culture is part of the manosphere. The alt-right is part of the manosphere. And I think if you stretch it too much, you start including people with other values, other beliefs. So my main criterion for inclusion is if a group mostly self-defines as belonging to that manosphere, mostly identifies with the label, then I'm going to include it. And I ended up with a typology that has five main uh, communities. That seems fair enough. I, I certainly like the classification idea of including people as the, as they say they are, um, as they you know attribute themselves as members. Yeah, it's one of the trends in the social sciences, for sure. So, for example, for ethnic surveys, uh, it wouldn't really be found moral or accurate to have someone knocking on your door and noting on their notepad if you're black, white, or Latino, right? No, it's self-identification questions for race. So I think it's uh, it can be a valid principle for things that relate to identity very closely. That, that's an interesting comparison. What are those five main groups that you've identified in your research? So the older one is men's rights activists, and they have also an offline presence because they are a more they look more like a traditional movement than other groups because they have local chapters, associations, and basically they advocate for the right of men, boys, divorced fathers, and they try to fight for some reforms to combat what they perceive as structural inequalities against men. There's men going their own way, which shares loads of the diagnosis with the men's rights activists, but instead of ter turning towards lobbying and activism, they turn towards separatism. So they just say, we're going to live our lives away from women. So they try to eschew romantic sexual relationships and being involved with women. There's incels, whom uh, you've talked about on your podcast. So groups of involuntary celibate men who gather around their identity based on their sexlessness and their inability to find romance and intimate relationships. There's pickup artists, on the other hand, uh, the other oldest part of the manosphere, which are dating guides, seduction coaches that try to give tips and techniques for young men on how to uh, pick up women. And lastly, there's the red pill, which is kind of a combination of elements from uh, several of these communities. It will both have an element of what pickup artists call game, that is seduction techniques for men. On, but they will frame that as the red pill being a guide to establish a sexual strategy for men that's more holistic, that has more elements than just pickup techniques. It's also about masculinity, about how you behave in society that is perceived as being hostile towards men, which is one of the other things that all those manosphere groups share. That's certainly the big one these days, isn't it? Red Pill has, you know, perhaps, and I'll, I'll go ahead and say probably, come to encapsulate too many individuals. I mean... Someone might use the term in common internet parlance, red pill, to refer to anyone from incels to Andrew Tate. But, but that's not, in speaking to you privately, it seems that that's, that's not quite right. Could you expand more on what the red pill actually is as a group and what, what distinguishes it? So yeah, there's loads of blurriness around the idea of red pill because at the core is just a concept that comes from the Matrix movies. And it's just this idea that you can take a pill that shows you the ugly truth or and it's the red pill or you can swallow the blue pill and stay in the comfortable world of illusions. And so that's a metaphor that's been used by different groups and it's also popular among alt-right communities. And so whenever a group is going to picture themselves as being really anti-system or trying to counter the narratives of, uh, of the establishment, then the red pill metaphor is handy, right? Because you can say to your followers, come swallow the red pill, you're going to swallow the bitter truth, but what you've been told your whole life is a web of lies. 
So I think that's why the term is also so popular because it's a little blurry. I think applying it to incels is misleading because incels do themselves say they believe in something called the black pill, which you've described on the um, episode before of your podcast. So, I mean, if they say themselves they are black pilled, I'm not going to call them red pilled, which unfortunately you can find in the media or in some pieces of research. And as as far as the manosphere goes, the red pill community itself at the core is something that started in the 2010s mostly on Reddit. So there was a red pill subreddit. It still exists. It's been quarantined, but it's still publicly accessible. And it was, as I said, this combination of pickup artists. So men who used to go on pickup forums and be dating coaches, but it got more and more politicized and it got enmeshed in this view of Western society as being decadent, Western women as being... um promiscuous or morally once again decadent and so they started embracing some narratives that were much more political and still weaving that with techniques on how to be a successful man Uh, so an alpha man and a very masculine type of figure independent um, someone who doesn't owe anything to anyone else so there's also loads of self-help in there and this conflation is what the red pill is and it has definitely turned more to the political side so if you go to their backup site they have a backup site called trp.red you can see that it's a lot about bashing the democrats and joe biden they also got very angry about uh, the covid masks mandates and the vaccines so there seems to be some cross-pollination between uh, the radical right ideas Um, and the red pill, which at first was mostly about seduction, but it's, it's become more than this. That's fascinating. I didn't know that about the red pill. I I'd heard from William about the black pill folks that they're actually less right wing, uh, than the media typically paints them as, but you're saying that it is, that it is an accurate portrayal to say that the red pill is a, is a largely right wing movement. If you go to the, the Red Pill platforms today and you look at the, the language that's being used, the memes and the phrases that circulate, you will find loads of overlap with the alt-right for sure. Uh, there's been some research on how the Red Pill subreddit contributed to Donald Trump's election uh, with uh, you know internal takeovers or moderators propagating some type of content or information on the, on the subreddit. And mostly, let's say, in the current internet culture wars that have become very polarized, the red pill and most of the manosphere have definitely been throwing their lot with the anti-trans, anti-progressive, and they use all the phrases that you could find in the alt-right. So Because they've been anti-feminist for a very long time, so it makes sense for them in this great internet culture war that's become extremely virulent and polarized to have followed the trend. And just to be clear, would you say it's fair to classify, I don't know if the, how they how they self-identify, but these, do you think of those big viral all-male podcasts that, you know, bring on t- tons of young women and then uh, dunk on them in, in various ways, you know, um, oftentimes in a very sexist manner, are those are those generally red pill or 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 is it again just about how they identify at an individual level? So I think there's it's the internet, so ideas circulate very quickly, and there's definitely things from, for example, the original red pill texts. They had they write a lot. They have a sidebar on their subreddit, which is reading uh, readings that you're supposed to do when you join the community. So they have loads of material, they have blogs, write books, podcasts, and I think those ideas somewhat percolate for sure to more popular types of content. But when I listen to things like, you know, Andrew Tate, I can see for sure the red pill roots and origins of uh, this type of content that's being uh, becoming very popular with new types of media like TikTok. And so I would say that if you show me one specific type of show, I could probably be able to identify some tropes, for example, that come from uh, the red pill. Is there any insight we can get into how many people are actually, you know, 
card carrying members of the Manosphere. It's very hard to do because, well, it's on the internet, so just uh, location data is almost, I mean, it's in the hands of private companies, but it's uh, hard to access for researchers. Even though I know your supervisor has been able to do some cool location Twitter studies with incels, for example. Um, so if you look at the main, the biggest Manosphere platforms on Reddit, for example, it's a hundred, a couple hundred thousands uh, of members on the subreddits. Now it doesn't tell you the story about the amount of lurkers, that is the amount of people who come and consume the content, but never really write anything or never really join those communities. And if you try to measure the downstream influences, it becomes much, much harder as well. I mean, I saw a survey that said that the youth in the UK were more familiar with Andrew Tate than with their own prime minister. So if you go all that way to people who embody or who invoke some of the tropes from the manosphere, you could be very scared about the influence it has on people. And just anecdotally, I've noticed over the years of discussing my research with various people that there's a clear generational uh, gap for sure in that uh, anyone over 30 years old who's just doing their thing, living their life is probably not going to have heard about uh, those groups and the younger people are much more aware of this and especially men for sure. And incels have definitely, I been, I think, been the main driving factor behind this because as soon as incels committed a few terror attacks, the media stepped in and it became, of course, a big news story. And then suddenly you could see a very big shift in the amount of research that's being directed towards them, the amount of media scrutiny. And of course, it seeps down to the amount of awareness that people have. So uh, that would be my answer, but it's, it's very hard to estimate However, something I can guarantee is that there's an international spread of those ideas as well. So I'm mostly researching the English-speaking manosphere. But uh, whenever you go, if you just go to Instagram or Facebook and you type uh, men going their own way, for example, which is uh, a group that adheres to the red pill, you will find groups all over the Middle East, North Africa, South America, so there's uh, iterations of this manosphere in different languages. There's a French manosphere, there's an Italian manosphere, there's a Spanish-speaking manosphere. So it seems to be quite a strong cultural influence for sure. For sure. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, in listening to you talk about, you know, the shifts over the last few years, you really couldn't have chosen a better time to pick up this topic. I, I, I guess it, it makes me curious, how did you come to study the Manosphere? Why, why did you choose this topic? So I think to answer that question, I have to present the, the focus and angle of my research because my initial interest was in evolutionary behavioral sciences and evolutionary psychology, which you cover a lot in your podcasts and which you also work in. And so I noticed... And it, I need to say first that I'm from France, and in France, it's something that's much less popular. So I did my training as a social scientist, and you don't hear about evolutionary approaches to human behavior, usually. And so when I discovered these things, I was very curious, I started going online, and I realized that a lo loads of the people and the content that actually routinely invoked and employed those theories, which as an aside, I think were fascinating and very interesting scientific endeavors, but most of the people who actually used them were those red pill type guys, were those uh, men's rights type activists. And so that's how I thought, well, that's a great research topic because I can just study how the manosphere uses evolutionary science, which is my focus. And this way I'll get to do what I've been trained to do, which is sociology all the while perfecting and honing my knowledge of evolutionary sciences. That's great. That's a that's a that's a fascinating angle into uh, into a very hot topic. So you're looking as a next step. This is uh, this is your warm up for doing some evolutionary science in the future. We'll see. I mean, I uh, I know the the theory behind, you know, social science, evolutionary behavioral science. And I think everyone would agree on the fact that they should not be separated. I mean, I think humans evolved by natural selection, uh, just like every other 
organisms. And I also think that, you know, economics, history, sociology have loads to tell us about human societies and, and behavior. So I don't know what direction I'm going to take my research further, but I would hope to integrate and especially in my writings and teaching also to try to integrate those perspectives, you know, the more proximate level types of analysis and maybe with more ultimate type of work as well. well you've got a you've got a very broad base uh, to go into that. I, I, I almost envy it. I'm certainly more narrowly evolutionary. Could you give us a potted history of the manosphere? Could you give us a quick summary of where this group actually came from and also how it's coherent over time? Uh, what what What's the relationship between the original manosphere and the thing that has come about today? I know, I know I'm giving you a, a very complicated question that's probably better suited to a, to a book topic, but uh, um, uh, if you could just give us even a flavor, I'd be very grateful. For sure. So the men's rights movement is the oldest in the manosphere and it started in the 1970s. So there were some issues that some male activists thought were structurally unfair for men. And this was the time of uh, what's also called commonly the second wave of feminism. So it was a, a time of restructuring of gender norms and uh, people were all, not all, but there was a strong push towards advocating for gender equality and deconstructing traditional gender roles. And so some men went into that breach and were briefly, in fact, feminists. And uh, some remained feminists and some kind of uh, broke away because they started focusing more on male issues that they thought were being disregarded in society. So a big one at the time was the military draft. You know, there, there had been the World War II with millions of conscripted men. There's been the war in Korea and now it was the Vietnam War. And each time, just if you were born a man, you could be enrolled in the army and sent off to a faraway land to die for your country. And so these guys were saying, I mean, it doesn't look like I'm privileged here. And it started that way. And also in the 60s, divorce started rising dramatically because, you know, morality started changing and those family value norms started changing as well. And so with the, the, the spread of divorce, there also came the issue of custody for children and those men started to organize father's rights organizations to defend their interests in court and to try to fight what they saw as a biased family court system. So that would be the origin of the men's rights movement and it planted the seeds of the whole manosphere. To me it's the intellectual crucible of the manosphere in that it kind of reversed the feminist perspective of men are oppressing women to a view where men were structurally disadvantaged in society just because they were men. And so with the years, over the years, it grew more and more opposed to feminism, so much so that it's been even classified as a hate group by an NGO, the Seventh Poverty Law Center, that monitors hate groups. One of the main uh, leading men's rights activists of the 21st century called Paul Elam has been classified uh, as, you know, promoting uh, male supremacy. But at the start, it was mostly an egalitarian program focusing on men's issues. And you still find some men's rights activists who are much more moderate than what we've been describing so far in this podcast. And some even are would describe themselves as, you know, left-wing liberals. So, for example, on Reddit, there's a community of left-wing male advocates. I think it's 15,000 strong or something like that. So that's the origin, but I say it's the intellectual crucible of the later developments because it started planning this idea that, you know, men could organize as men in groups of men to talk about their own, you know, gender issues, male-specific issues. And then the internet appeared. And as soon as the late 1980s, you can see the seeds of the contemporary manosphere being put in place. So you had, uh, before the World Wide Web was introduced in 1993, there was a network called Usenet, where some of the early adopters of the internet were basically chatting. It was like a, a forum, if you will. And there were groups called alt.men, alt.feminazis on Usenet that started creating the, you know, online kind of 
sexists, men's locker room talk culture. And it was also at that time that the pickup artists really took off online on Usenet and then later in the early internet. And so pickup artists were these seduction coaches and dating guides. And these are the two oldest branches of the manosphere. And from these branches, you can see that they feature some elements. So there's the self-help aspect that you find in loads of those groups. There's the male grievances aspect that you find also in loads of those groups. And the third one was anti-feminism. I mean, it wasn't that strong in pickup artistry to start with. But as I've described uh, with the red pill, most of these groups have been sliding towards the right in the cultural debates and have been getting um, more and more radically anti-system and anti-establishment with time. So, you know, it started as early as the internet, basically. You had groups of men who discussed their experiences as men and who were rather anti-feminist. How do we see groups like incels and who, you know, really hate pickup artists and MG Tao, who would be, you know, skeptical of the idea of like a meaningful red pill mating strategy for men that's, you know, actualizing and worth pursuing. I mean, these groups disagree with each other, as you know, but much better than me. How do we get this multi-headed monster? And uh, I, I, I guess if we could get more of a through line connecting them, that would be appreciated as well. Well, you know, it's the Internet, so communities, groups, ideas propagate very easily. There's cross-pollination, synthesis happening all the time. And, and there's also these slides toward more polarization, for sure, and more radicality. So if you look at incels, they were created in the late 90s as a support group for the, romantic, uh, the romantically unsuccessful. And uh, it was created by a woman, in fact. It was, you know, inclusive, LGBT-friendly at first, and people who just come and share their, their difficulties in dating. And then, starting in the 2000s, it cross-pollinated with more of gamer, geek, 4chan-type culture. Um, and it also got more and more hateful towards pickup artists because pickup artists were those dating coaches that told young men, here is how you can attract someone, here is how you can find uh, intimacy, and incels were, were not having it, so they were very resentful and skeptical of pickup artists. And so you can see a slide towards uh, something that becomes male exclusive, and then with time something that becomes misogynistic, so much so that they were all banned from Reddit, and now if you go to incel forums, you will find a lot of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, um, racist tropes and phrases. And so uh, there seems to be a shift in that regard. I've described it for the red pill as well, for pickup artists and for men's rights activists. There seems to be a, yeah, a shift towards more radicality. But in terms of processes, what we know from some available data is that there is huge overlap between communities. So, for example, um, when the MGTOW subreddit was formed on, on Reddit, I think half the original user base or um, big data studies have revealed a, a, an overlap of 50% of the people who started using that subreddit came from the original men's rights subreddit. And it makes sense because on the internet, we're not talking about membership where you have a card, where you pay a subscription to an organization, a movement. You just have to click. So it's very easy to participate in several communities at once. And the boundaries are much more blurry and flexible. So you can find some ideologies that kind of combine and cross-pollinate through various means, like memes, for example, very easily. And for example, there was an attempted uh, coup d'etat in Germany. I think last year, and it was by a community who were monarchists, so, you know, anti-Republican, they wanted to install a uh, monarchy in Germany, but they were also using loads of alt-right tropes and incel memes and jargon and, you know, anti-counter-terrorist types of agencies are now really struggling because they are always behind these new, more and more radical, extreme, fringe type of communities that emerge on the internet and having myself been on discord and perused 
loads of this type of content, I can tell you that there are, you know, troubling synthesis happening and things that you would not even think of, like uh, Japanese anime figures mixed with Nazi propaganda, for example, or things like that. Fascinating. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly don't envy... I, f I find this all so interesting, but I also don't envy your position as a researcher. I, I, I've got a couple questions related to that. One of them is just how, how do you come to, I mean, we, we've said repeatedly, you know, it's the internet and that's, you know, there's, there's an upside to that and a downside to that. The upside is that it's very accessible, but the downside is that it's a mess. I mean, if I had to do what you do, I don't even know where I'd start. I guess I'm interested, and I think most of my listeners will be as well. What's the mechanical process of coming to be an expert on, you know, internet history and I guess to an extent, you know, cultural anthropology? What what are you doing mechanically to, to get this perspective? And how does that look? How does that look in practice? So when the internet started getting more and more popular and in the 2000s, you find the first textbooks on methodology and how to study it by virtual ethnographers or digital sociologists, they would all say, well, the internet is like your ethnographer's dream. You can access the fields just by sitting in your living room behind your computer and you can access in, in real time what those people are saying. And if you add to that big data techniques that are available today by using AI, so you can actually scrape the data from a whole subreddit, for example, or a whole forum and use automated techniques to analyze millions of tweets, uh, you know, millions of forum posts and threads. So in that regard, uh, the Internet, as you said, makes things very accessible. But on the other hand, loads of data that you would have if, let's say, I was to do an ethnography of a trade union in my city, I would know, you know, I could meet the people, know what they look like, where they're from, know about their age, their location, interview them. But on the internet, this is all very hard. So loads of the traditional data that you have in the social sciences, like socioeconomic status, age, level of education, location data is really hard to access on the internet. So it means that mechanically, most of the research that you find is based on discourse analysis. So, you know, what's most accessible in terms of data is the discourse that these people produce, that people produce on the internet. It can be YouTube, Twitter, Twitter, it can be forums, but basically people come from various fields. There can be literature scholars, they can be sociologists, they can be I don't know, criminology scholars. And they say, well, I'm going to study this forum. I'm going to sample those 10, 100, 1,000 tweets or whatever threads. And then I'm going to try to identify, to deconstruct the language and the ideology. So I'm going to identify the underlying tropes and values and what words are associated with other words. I'm going to try to summarize this community's beliefs. And there's been loads of that type of research. But there's also been a recognition that this is not enough, that what people say on the internet is just that, it's just what people say on the internet. But if we really want to understand those phenomena, we also need to understand what place does this internet activity take in their daily lives? How does it influence their, for example, electoral behavior? Um, do they actually... Maybe, I mean, there seems to be a share of people who go on the internet just to be trolling for fun, to say, you know, to vent or to say outrageous things, but then they go on about their lives and they are just perfectly integrated and, you know, citizens that just lead an ordinary daily life. So there still seem, needs to be more research on that. But once again, it's, it's kind of really hard to do. Yeah, it is. I mean, I appreciate that these might be unfixable limitations, but one that comes to mind immediately is just that, so, so you've already mentioned that some of the posters are going to be deliberately disingenuous, especially in this community. And it might be hard to, you know, separate uh, deeply held beliefs from, you know, impulsive rantings that don't reflect anyone's beliefs. Uh, I remember in speaking to William about 
incels, he had some numbers about what percent of incels lurk versus post. And it's, you know, some diminishing group that's doing almost all the posting as, as is with most distributions, right? It's going to be a small group of people doing most of basically anything. But when you're doing discourse analysis, is there any concern about, you know, I'm seeing who's speaking, but maybe I'm not seeing what's being listened to, right? Like, let's say, the the tip of the iceberg is presenting a set of beliefs that might not be actually absorbed by the rest of the iceberg. Is there any uh, is there any concern about that or attempts to correct for it or is it just part of you know part of doing business? Absolutely, there there's uh, there's concern about that. So for example, there's been studies on the MGTOW main forum that showed that I think it was just the top one percent of posters uh, who did the majority of the posts. So in a way, if you're just studying those forums, you get mostly, and they call them super posters, you get those very active ideologists and popularizers who spread their ideas. But it, we don't know how much it reflects everyone's opinions for sure. But I would say that's, that's what you get when you study any type of ideology. So if you study the history of communism, most people are going to start by reading Marx and Lenin and no one is going to find the obscure trade unionist in Czechoslovakia who wrote something in uh, 1928, you know. So I think in a way it's a bias, but that we all agree to that when you study some type of ideology, you start with its key representatives. You start with its more active and eloquent figures. And so in a way, I realized that's one of the things I'm doing in my research. And to try to counterbalance that, I'm also, I've also been using random sampling to try to make sure to have more of a picture of the base. But even in that base, there are biases where some people speak more, speak louder, are more active. And that's, that's almost impossible to control for if you just stay in the realm of studying discourse. And if you wanted to go over that, you would need to do you know, opinion research, you would need to actually conduct large scale surveys with that type of methodology to actually assess the prevalence of certain beliefs. Fascinating. I mean, I, I, I'm sure you're doing a great job. But again, <laughs> the uh, the sentence, I don't envy you is coming to mind. It, it, it seems like very difficult work to do. I guess, in thinking about the mechanics, a lot of these super posters, I don't know if you'd agree with this classification, but a lot of these the podcasters, writers, book writers, uh, posters on Reddit, a lot of them are intentionally or otherwise acting as propagandists for their movement, right? They're, they're trying to sell a vision of the world in a way that's absorbable. And there's also probably some internet selection bias where the more absorbable stuff is is probably rising to the top at least to an extent uh, the more memeable uh, beliefs and ideas the ones that spread most infectiously are probably spreading more regularly and that <laughs> don't take this the wrong way but that almost makes me concerned for for your experience have you and and i i, I feel totally happy to you know skip this question or 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 edit it out ex post facto but have you found any have you found any influence on yourself i mean if i had to spend my day sifting through an ideology right reading 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 all of these ideas over and over again i mean it's it's almost like doing it's almost like doing rebt on yourself to to make you uh to make you believe something uh, has there been any you know, uh, sense that that this this process has influenced your thinking, or do you feel that you're you're well insulated against it? That's a very interesting question, and of course, that's something I've been thinking about. My first reaction to this question would be to say that, in a way, it's good that you are able to put yourself in the people you are studying's shoes. That is, if you want to understand an ideology really deep down it's good that you've consumed so much of it, so much of the content, that you're immediately able to, to reflect on how those people perceive reality and what they think about. If you don't do that, you're stuck with explanations like, oh, it has to be a scam, it's a plot, they are manipulated by a few savvy people, or, oh, they are just playing crazy, for example. 
But of course, things are more complex than this. So in a way, I think it's necessary to be influenced in a way that you start seeing events and reflecting on how the people you study would think about them. Uh, I, I don't know if you have any cultural anthropology background, but that's the view of a lot of modern ethnographers is that you really have to try and become become part of the society as much as you can in terms of uh in terms of your behavior and thinking in order to truly understand it but anyway i'll i'll, I'll just kind of hand the mic back to you i apologize for the interruption i i didn't say i would mimic those people's beliefs and actions though but the, the thing is for example from a european perspective it's kind of hard to grapple with american conservatives those you know, religious fundamentalists, anti-abortion, pro-guns, anti-welfare states, the whole thing looks weird to us from the outside. And so uh, political scientists have been trying to find models to explain it. Is it all a scam? Are they manipulated by some business elites? Um, who's flaming the culture war? Are these people just plain crazy? And of course, these models are a little condescending for those people. You know, they are just humans who have their own beliefs, interests, who are pursuing them who are pursuing status in organizations, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why I think it's actually good, but also a little frightening that you start seeing things through their lens. So for example, I saw a, a news about the California university system that would have every teacher being explicitly anti-racist in their curricula. And my first reaction was in an American context, wow, the, the radical rightists, the, the Trump guys are not going to like that. They're going to hate it. I can tell what they're going to think about it and say about it. And then I paused for a second and I said, but what do I believe about it? So almost intuitively, because it's in a foreign context. So, you know, when I study the United States, to me, it's also my field of study and the English speaking world. And I think it was a little shocking, but also interesting to see that their own view of the thing immediately popped in my mind. Now, as regards personal beliefs, I think it doesn't really have a big impact on me because, I mean, as soon as I started learning about history and sociology, feminism was very intuitive to me. And so I can't say I've really changed my position overall by reading loads of anti-feminist content. But I think after a while, you start getting desensitized as well. Uh, to the the misogyny, the violence, the um, the racist epithets. Um, so yeah, it's just like when you study. I think anything it starts becoming your your research object, and so everything about it becomes very interesting for analytical purposes. But maybe the emotional aspect gets muted down a little bit. I think it's easier for me as a man as well. Uh, I know some we female researchers have reported more emotional distress because, of course, you're reading things all day that directly attack or belittle you. And uh, yeah, so that would be my answer. I think you need some degree of putting yourself in other people's shoes to try to really understand the way an ideology and a community works. But in terms of actually shifting my beliefs, I can't say uh, it has had a big effect on me, no. That's, a, that's, a, that's very good news. Uh, I'm glad to hear that. And I think that everyone has probably been a little desensitized just by the recent virality of some of these Manosphere or downstream of Manosphere characters. I guess now if we're set on the descriptive side of things, I'm hoping everyone has a pretty good vision of the Manosphere and you're welcome to jump in if you feel anything else needs to be clarified. But I want to get more into your research, right? And we've touched on this a little bit. You're looking at the intersection between the evolutionary sciences and the manosphere. Could you elaborate on, first, why that's something worth investigating, right? And second, what exactly you are investigating? So loads of manosphere content producers will explicitly reference evolution so they will say men and women are different because of sexual selection. They will talk about mate preferences. They will talk about um, the brain being hardwired to do this and that. And um, it's, it's a big part of their discourse, depending on the type of community. Some are more keen on these types of explanations, some are less so. 
but it's a, it's a decent size of their type of sources and justifications. And so what I'm very interested in is trying to tease out, you know, the wheat from the chaff, trying to understand where they get the science right, where they get it wrong, um, and maybe more importantly, the just this debunking endeavor, how does evolutionary science fit in their worldview? Why is it that it was the science that was appropriated and not, let's say, sociology, for example, by these movements? And how, how are the findings of the science made to fit some pre-existing worldviews and beliefs, you know? Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. And I guess, uh, I guess that's a good place to get into those actual beliefs. So let's keep this to, so we've spoken about beliefs shared within the manosphere, but let's now talk very seriously about evolutionarily relevant beliefs. Is there any EvPsych that's shared with at least most of the manosphere? And when I say EvPsych, I guess I mean more, you know, human evolutionary behavioral sciences. Is there any belief that across the manosphere would be subscribed to based on evolutionary logic? So one thing that differ differentiates the manosphere public from the traditional American right is that it's evolutionary, right? In itself, there's loads of fundamentalism and the religious right is still starkly creationist in the United States. So all those groups agree about natural selection, and I would say to some degree they incorporate evolutionary psychology in their ideology, but they do so from different angles. So pickup artists are trying to craft seduction techniques, so they will make dating guides that use Darwinian principles and research on mate's value and mate selection to try to help people have uh, sexual success. And men's rights activists, they think that men are being oppressed as a group in society, so they are going to do evolutionary anthropological storytelling about human universals and how this state of affair evolved. So um, there's no widespread unified interpretation of F-Psych in the manosphere, if you will. But I would say that Maybe the main thing they take from it is the sex differences, for sure. I mean, one of the reasons why evolutionary psychology, I think, is so popular is that it's one of the sciences that actually studies sex differences. And more than studying and documenting those through empirical studies and evidence, it also gives you a powerful explanatory frame to try to understand them, right? Sexual selection... Men and women have had different f selective pressures over history because of their different uh, reproductive apparatus. And so that's a very easy idea to understand. And it's been very easily appropriated as people on the internet spontaneously generate evolutionary hypotheses uh, to try to make sense of the gender differences that they see around them in society. And loads of the time... Uh, it fits some trends that you can see in the empirical evidence, but it's grossly exaggerated. So the division the of the differences between the sexes is much stronger in the manosphere. If I had one of main findings to share, of course, is that um, the sex differences are seen as much stronger than what anyone or anything in the evolutionary literature would ever say. And the second maybe slide is that what they're investigating, what they're very fond of, is usually kind of negative towards women. And they don't investigate as much, <clears throat> let's say, the, the distasteful aspects of male nature, for example. So it ends up depicting a, a biased version of the literature. I mean, I think you, you research infidelity yourself. And um, they've been invoking research on the evolution of female mating strategies to say, this is what we've been saying all along. Women are unfaithful. They will want your resources out from you. And then they will go for another partner because he has more uh, status. 
and they actually invoke evolutionary hypotheses that you find in the literature, like the, the good genes hypothesis, the sexy sons hypothesis, and they do this to show that their view of women as being very shallow, materialistic, and ready to dump you uh, whenever is based in the empirical science. And you can find some modicum of evidence for that, but what they don't scrutinize is the male side of things, which is, you know, infidelity seems to be even more prevalent with men. And from an evolutionary perspective, it's quite easy to explain how that would have developed. So I would think in a way, I'm more than investigating what they get right or wrong. I'm mostly trying to investigate selective interpretation of evidence, cherry picking, and how it fits in their pre-existing, you know, worldviews and narratives about women and men, for example. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing that I've found very frustrating and funny about this group as a scientist who's worked on infidelity and continues to work on infidelity as an as a evolutionary problem is that you, there's definitely the cherry picking, there's definitely the exaggerating, but the, f the funniest part is that they go from being the most credulous absorbers of information ever, right, the, to being the most hard-nosed evidence skeptics of all time based purely on what view, uh, you know, the, the, the individual study supports. So they'll happily trumpet a, a tiny ovulation study that failed to replicate and, uh, you know, showed very small effect sizes and say, see, this is, you know, look at this, look at this incredible thing that's based on, by the way, you know, survey data because it's just asking women when when did you have your period and did you have extra pair of fantasies so it's all survey data right and they'll rely on that as as gospel and then turn around and i'm being very general here but then they'll turn around and if you look at the many many studies really just finding after finding after finding going back now a hundred years uh, literally a century of research on this that shows that men cheat more than women right then, oh, suddenly survey data is no good, right? Suddenly, suddenly we have to be skeptical. Suddenly, you know, psychology is just bad science, right? It, 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 is, it is a trend that I've noticed very narrowly in the, in the research that I'm familiar with. But just to kind of repeat back, I guess, what, you, what you're saying, so I make sure that I'm not misunderstanding you. You're saying that they pick out some things from the psychological literature on sex differences that as a unifying theme across the manosphere, they like evolution, right? They love research on sex differences, but they tend to exaggerate those sex differences and only investigate them in a light that's unfavorable to women, ignoring the, you know, uh, the laundry list of F-Psych findings that are frankly very negative towards men. I mean, David Buss, most cited scholar in the field, had to write an entire book titled When Men Behave Badly, just to capture this, this you know, this, uh, this amount of literature. But um, is, is, that, is that me accurately interpreting what you said in terms of unifying, uh, unifying manosphere F-Psych-ish or evolutionary beliefs? It's very hard to unify the manosphere because there are really diverse groups and beliefs. I would, I would say what you think is accurate for all the groups except the men's rights activists. And men's rights activists are much more egalitarian in their outlook and rhetoric at least. As I said, their origins are as a gender equality movement. You know, they're, they are trying to fight against uh, what they perceive as, you know, oppressive features of society against men. And so they have a different reading of the literature that once again fits their own worldview. So they are using evolutionary hypothesizing to try to explain this state of affairs. And what they will say is, look, men's reproduction over history was negligible. A man is just worth, uh, in terms of reproduction, a man is very replaceable because if you die... Uh, other men are <laughs> full of semen, basically, whereas eggs and uh, women are much more valuable reproductive resources. So they are using, they are starting from the premise that we call anisogamy in evolutionary biology. But the conclusion they make from that is that they will say this explains why men have been disposable over history. This explains why cultures have repeatedly sent men off to die in war why cultures even today are using men to do the brunt of the physical labor 
and why no one cares about the homeless when they are men, etc., etc. So here, once again, they use a reading of basic evolutionary biology principles um, to try to advance their own agenda in a way that's really not congruent at all with Darwinian theory, by the way, because we know that genes are selfish, and so uh, men also compete with each other to reproduce a lot, and it doesn't make it wouldn't make sense. Uh, it would work as a species, you know, to maybe have less men or to have males that sacrifice themselves for the welfare of the group, but we know that's not how natural selection operates. And we know that males are also actors in this Darwinian struggle and they have evolved to succeed in it. They have not evolved to be doormats or to put women on pedestals as uh, these types of group would think, for example. So it's much more subtle than people who would say women used to go to the, the picking of berries and men used to go hunting and so there are sex differences and we are using this science to justify male supremacy and dominance. You find actually very little of that in the manosphere. It's more elaborate uses of evolutionary principles and hypothesizing to try to fit one's existing worldview or even anecdotal observations about the world. Another key difference about the, the science you find in the manosphere and the one you find in the literature is that all these men have very strong emotions regarding what they discuss. Uh, a lot of men come to the manosphere after a divorce, a bad breakup. They report, you know, experiences of infidelity, of manipulation. Basically, loads of them have had bad experiences with women. And so, once again, the readings that you find in the literature, they can be selective, cherry-picked, but they can also be f framed by really, really strong value judgments and emotions that you don't find in the literature. So, for example, researchers who study infidelity, they just see it as a fact of life and they try to explain it. And so the same research about infidelity, and I think it's a, it's a very interesting dynamic, can be used both by feminists or anti-feminists, as is, because depending on your pre-existing set of values, research can be appropriate in both ways. So if you find research about female mating strategies that show that, oh, women are sexually strategizing, they are thinking about, they don't put all their eggs in the same basket, they are having backup partners, that's the, the mate switching hypothesis from David Buss, or they are uh, sleeping with multiple males, to have paternity confusion and ensure resources from loads of men. Well, this type of research coming from primatology was seen as feminist. It was seen as a breakthrough because this, the point was to say, look, biology was sexist. It thought that w females were all passive. Females were coy since the time of Darwin. And those feminist primatologists, uh, who were also evolutionary scientists, started saying this does not fit the data. And females in the wild can be actually sexually assertive, they can be promiscuous. And so this was seen as a feminist breakthrough, but the same research, without being necessarily distorted, is now being used, for example, by incels to say women are all cheats, um, they are all natural cheaters, they can't help it, it's in, it's in their nature, it's biology. And so, because they have a negative value judgment about female promiscuity, notably because they are excluded from uh, this sexual activity of women, they can use the same, the exact same research for different ends. Uh, another example I think is interesting is that of EDCs, endocrine disrupting chemicals. Incels are very fond about research on EDCs because... Um, they kind of map it onto existing conspiracy theories that men in the West are being feminized by some kind of LGBT slash feminist slash Jewish type of conspiracy establishment. And so they see endocrine disrupting chemical research as a manifestation of that. So there are some compounds, chemical compounds that we find in, in lakes, in rivers and in our drinking water that have some hormones in them, estrogen, uh, notably that come from contraceptive pills, right? But 
the way that you can, the way that they interpret their research, I think is a very good example of how people can interpret or invoke research depending on where they come from, because incels do not have sex. So they will say, well, let's just ban contraception. To them, it makes sense. You are someone who does not have sex and you learn that your own drinking water is being polluted by contraceptives. So the obvious solution to them is let's just ban the pill. You know, those promiscuous people are just ruining everyone's health. And from their perspective, it does make sense. So, you know, what I'm interested in with my research is trying to really describe and lay out the worldviews and ideologies of these groups to better understand how the science is mapped out unto their worldviews. Oh my gosh. I mean, th- this is, uh, yeah, this is, this is the well is going much deeper than I expected. And this is all very interesting. I, I just really want to emphasize, I, I think that your, your point there, what you've noticed, I, 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 I mean, I, I kind of can't believe that, that I haven't uh, heard this pointed out before because it's, it's, it's it, now that you've said it, it's so clear but a really brilliant observation there that you're right, that a lot of these initial findings on female mating strategies and female, uh, and, you know, women's mating strategies as well. It's not just primatology. A lot of these initial findings at their time were touted as liberatory and feminist and good And also, you know, were to some extent resisted by certain more conservative, more, you know, males compete, women choose um, scientists as well at the time who maybe were, I wouldn't wouldn't necessarily say anti-feminist, but were maybe skeptical of that worldview. And now we have a total reversal with the same data where the exact same set of facts is now being trumpeted for a completely opposite reason. That's a, that's a really good one and, and worth noting, I guess, in just realizing how much there, there would be potentially to talk about, are there any specific manosphere beliefs from any individual group that are, I mean, things like hypergamy come to mind, but, but, uh, but I'll let you take the wheel. Are there any specific beliefs where there's a evolutionary where there's where there's a particularly evolutionary narrative that's particularly popular but there's a gap between what they're saying and what researchers are saying are there are there any i i know that we can't possibly get to all of them but is there is there anything that you'd like to share with my audience on that front so if we go back to the area of sex differences these men use female mating strategy research to prove their points, but they also got this point from their own personal experiences and for, for example, you know, the higher female mate preference for resources and status, they basically exaggerate that to the point that they almost think that men are women, you know, the the men are from Mars, women are from Venus trope. All that kind of reasoning is, is very strong in the manosphere. And so their vision of women is uh, that they would be very shallow, very materialistic. And in the red pill, there's this idea that women are even incapable of true love. They think that romantic love is something that men can feel, but that a woman would always constantly be, be thinking about either cheating or... Uh, because she's uh, inherently hypergamous, as you said, uh, that is, she's always looking for higher status and resources from uh, sexual partners, she will constantly be on the lookout for uh, something better. And of course, if you look at evidence for the mate switching hypothesis, you can see that there seems to be some form of cultivating backup partners uh, you can, of course, find a wide array of evidence showing that women seem to have a stronger preference than men for financial resources and status in their partners. And that's all uh, supported and predicted, I would say, even by you know evolutionary biology of mammals. But sometimes the sex difference goes so far as to actually contradict what we also know about sex differences, what the empirical literature seems to be indicating. So, for example, I mentioned the the cheating thing, the infidelity thing. 
they never mention male infidelity. And to me, that's just a case of the sexual double standard in action, because it means that female uh, females women uh, being uh, you know uh, cheat- cheaters is something that would deserve theorizing explanations grounded in science but there's no scrutiny towards the male tendency for the same behavior even though it is stronger based on the empirical evidence that we have and even though it is strongly predicted by anisogamy that you know uh, men would have more reproductive interest in sleeping around than women because they don't have to have the cost of pregnancy lactation and all that so i think in that regard you can see how selective the reading of the literature is and another example is empathy so since they interpret research on hypergamy uh, which they which they really make something that is central to female behavior and that's not the case if you look at the literature. I mean, I was just browsing to, towards the Encyclopedia of Evolutionary Psychological Sciences, and there's not even an entry on hypergamy, and it's mentioned like three times in the, in the volume. That's several thousands of pages. But if you go to red pill, red pill types of spaces, they will really make this the, the central pivot of female behavior, and they even call it the female imperative, or at least some writers do. And this, this makes them have this vision of women where, so since they are materialistic and they are hypergamous, they also have no empathy. And this is also linked to the men's rights activist narrative that I told you, that they think that over evolutionary history, everyone had more empathy for women because women are uh, precious reproductively for the species. So it's kind of a group selectionist type of reasoning. And so they will say that women have no empathy. And when, once again, you look at the literature that seems to be in psychology, it does seem that women show or have more empathy than men. I'm not, uh, I don't know if it comes from cultural conditioning, from evolution, but still here, I think is one of the clear cases where their distorted view of sex differences does not fit the available data. And there seems to be more, you know, everyday female empathy and empathetic behavior and we know that things like you know psychopathy and machiavellianism this type of dark triad traits where people have basically almost no empathy are more common in males for example yeah i mean that is just a couple of the ones that you said are just fascinating to me how they could even think that i mean the idea that women don't feel romantic love i mean if i would predict the sex difference in either direction and i don't know that there is one i mean the indicative evidence seems to be that that women would be more like, for example, we talked about mate switching. It does seem that women are more likely to be emotionally involved in the people they have sex with, period. Uh, women seem more um, inclined towards long term versus short term mating. In fact, short term mating is often oriented towards long term outcomes in women uh, compared to men where it's often not. And then w- again, with the empathy research, you're you're, you're bang on that the you know exhibition of dark triad traits is much higher much much higher in men and ironically i know that at least in the incel community the overrepresentation of dark triad traits is pretty stark i don't know if there's been any research out- outside of them i know that maybe incel research might be a little ahead of red pill research in terms of you know deep descriptive questionnaire studies but I, I, yeah, I, I just find, I just find, I just find a lot of this completely bewildering, and I, I'm, I'm also completely dumbfounded as to where in the evolutionary literature they picked up some of these ideas. I mean, some of them, the idea that you know that women like men with resources in general, on average, that that's you know well supported, even if they exaggerate it. But the love sex difference, the empathy sex difference, the infidelity sex difference, that women are more inclined towards cheating than men, that seems perfectly insane. Where, where are they getting all these ideas, if, if anywhere, um, other than just their own biases? Well, that's, that's what I was saying about how easy it is to appropriate evolutionary reasoning. Everyone can do a just-so story, that is, everyone can say oh, I noticed this difference anecdotally 
and probably it comes from our hunter gatherers ancestors and so you know those people are they've college educated they've read the selfish gene and and they've followed some uh, youtube courses uh, the ones by robert sapolsky uh, seem to be really popular and they know basic elements and principles of evolutionary biology if you go to the incel wikipedia They have pages and pages on sexual selection, on uh, the, the Fisher uh, runaway selection, Bateman's principle and all that. So once you understand those basics, it's quite easy to make hypotheses uh, any way you want. Any way you choose, you can make a narrative. And that's been a common criticism addressed to evolu evolutionary scientists, to be fair. And now scientists would say, well, these are just hypotheses. We're going to signal them as such. And then we're going to derive predictions and do empirical tests. We're going to do lab studies. We're going to do cross-cultural studies. We're going to compare it with other speeches. But this is the internet. So anyone can just make their own just-so story. And if it fits other people's pre-existing views or anecdotal observations, it can, it can pick up. And there are some key idea, ideologists and popularizers that definitely have made a, a trade out of using evo -psych principles and then uh, weave them into their own uh, worldview. And I think the best representative of that is Rollo Tomasi. Uh, and on his Amazon, Amazon author page, he even says explicitly that Uh, he's a evo psych popularizer, you know, and I know that he's uh, sent some of his books to Marty Hazelton, who is a, a you know esteemed evolutionary psychologist because he loves to cite her work, uh, and so you can see that there are some people who consume the scholarly literature and then who regurgitate it uh, to to appeal to other people's ideology. And if you go to the incel forums, you see that there are a few super posters who will link studies from reputable journals. Uh, there's also their own incel Wikipedia that links tons of studies from reputable journals. And then this gets interpreted and, and weaved into something different. And one of the other, by the way, I didn't answer, uh, I, have an, I have another example of mine of big difference between the literature And the manosphere is Intel's strong focus on physical appearances. So you described the black pill in your last show, which is the, the very gloomy and nihilistic worldview that Intel's have that if you are born ugly, uh, you are doomed to celibacy. And once again, here, what loads of evolutionary scientists tell me when, when they see that is that they're puzzled. They say, but... Most of our surveys show that women care less about looks than men. Most of our surveys show that qualities such as, you know, kindness, empathy, even resources that you can get those if you're ugly matter in mate selection. So here again, there's a very selective reading on research on physical attractiveness. And for sure, there's an effect of physical attractiveness on mating success and being more muscular is good and being taller is good and having maybe more masculinized facial features is good to some degree. And so they will find this evidence from the literature to support their worldview and their own lived experiences, which is I was bullied since I was a kid because I'm ugly. But here it's also puzzling researchers because it doesn't fit the broader picture of research on mate selection. Did you say, did I mishear you? Did you say that Rollo Tomasi sent his books to Marty Hazelton? Yeah, I think, I think she told me at least once that, uh, that he sent yeah, his book to her. Oh, that's so funny. Oh my gosh. So you, uh, you've actually managed to talk to Rollo. No, I've talked to Marty. Oh, talk to Marty. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. He repeatedly acknowledges his debt to her articles on, you know, ov ovulatory shifts and her research on female mate preferences, which, of course, as a female and presumably feminist uh, researcher, she's not, she's not thrilled about. But there are some instances of evolutionary scholars interacting with the manosphere, Uh, some of which have been more complacent and some of which have been more critical. And the latest example is actually yourself, Macken, and you've uh, actually debated a red pill pundit 
uh, around those uh, issues that we've been discussing. And I think that's a that's an avenue that is really brave because researchers have no incentive to do this professionally. They are just incentivized to publish research articles in their specialized journals and to kind of have this productivity in terms of research outputs. So the time that you're act- the fact that you're actually taking the time to go and, and, and tell red pill guys, listen, I read about the literature all day. I know about the science and I want to confront your ideas in a civil manner, I think is, uh, is really brave because of course you are also bound to receive some backlash. I mean, I've, I've had some threats, I've had some security concerns raised by my own research. So, you know, I really commend our researchers who do that, but I also realize that the incentives in the academic world are not set up at the moment to incentivize researchers to care about reception and understanding and appropriations of their research. So it's uh, it's the current state of affairs. Well, I, I mean, I appreciate the kind words on that front. Yes, I mean, I have I have debated one major red pill influencer who's very uh, Tomasi inspired. Anyway, I guess um, if there's no more on that, I, I would like to get back on to belief topics. I, I'm interested in where they disagree with each other. But before we go down that road, I just want to make sure that we've hit to your satisfaction the... And, and maybe we, we never can because there's so much of it, but their misuses of EvPsych. What, what other topics do they like to play with? So we've mentioned evolution of infidelity. We've mentioned mate preferences, sex differences, hypergamy. Um, as I said, the evolutionary hypothesizing is so flexible that I am... I am actually gathering all the just so stories and hypotheses I can find on the internet, and there's a wide variety. I mean, some are saying that women are twerking, and this is coming from an evolutionary legacy of lordosis, which is this curvature of of the of the backside that comes from other species. It's so flexible; you can take any story you want with evolution. So another thing that pickup artists, for example, are very keen on is the idea that they call approach anxiety. So pickup artists talk to shy young men, mostly, you know, romantically, sexually unsuccessful, and they try to teach them how to get more confident with women. So loads of their teaching revolve around having people come up to women and try to talk to them. And of course, this is bound to make them nervous. And here, they are once again using evolutionary storytelling, uh, which I don't think is a line of research I've seen a lot in the empirical literature. And I'm not saying it's necessarily a wrong hypothesis. I'm saying at the moment, it's just a story and it should be tested, you know, empirically and it should be confronted with data. And they will say things like, it's normal for you to have a knot in your belly when you approach women. Because ancestrally, you know, there would have been reputation damage done to you if she rejects your offer. You could have been beaten uh, by her brothers. Maybe she has uh, a husband already. And so they are once again trying to use evolutionary psychology to tell a story to their audience, which is these men that feel nervous. And they use hypothesizing to say, this is natural. It's even biological and it's normal that you feel nervous when you're trying to approach a woman because ancestrally uh, this would have been a costly thing to do. But they add in the current environment where everyone lives in big cities and there's much less reputational, um, let's say, gossip or people don't know you in a big city, you can actually approach women because this um, this ap- approach anxiety is an evolutionary mismatch. So here to take this concept from evolutionary psychology, interestingly, that of an evolutionary mismatch, that is things that have evolved in the past but that are not suited to our modern urban technological environments. 
And incels are also kind of fond of this mismatch idea, and they even have a category of incels which they call mism- mismatch cells, which is basically uh, incels that explain their celibacy by features that might have been attractive in the past, but that are a complete mismatch today. So as I said, uh, this is a very rich and deep topic, and you would be surprised by how many concepts and elements of the evolutionary literature are sometimes found on the internet. For example, you know, pickup artists had this technique they called peacocking, uh, which is trying to dress in a very flamboyant manner, wearing tall hats, colored clothes to attract the attention. And this was explicitly taken from the handicap principle, which is, you know, a hypothesis in evolutionary biology about uh, you are able to showcase your fitness by taking on a handicap to show your mates that you're so valuable genetically that you can even afford to have something very, you know, uh, for for example, something that's going to attract predators like a peacock's tail. So the popularity of evolutionary science in those um, communities is, uh, is on different levels. Some of them perceive themselves and understand their, their own lives through that lens which I think a lot of evolutionary scientists also do. And so my research also investigates how people's own life stories, how those people in the manosphere see their own lives through an evolutionary lens, because you can see that sometimes. And another thing that they do that you never find in the literature is that they do prospective evolution. They say the way things are going we are going to get selected out of the gene pool or with dating apps, this is going to happen. And, uh, you know, most evolutionary scientists look towards the past because it's so hard to predict, you know, uh, actual natural selection. And we are in very, um, we are in very modern environment that have, you know, contraception and also different uh, dynamics than the ones from the past. So, yes, I, I couldn't, I couldn't review all the, appropriations and uses of FSAC in the manosphere at all. Yeah, that'll be that'll be something that uh, hopefully you put into a book or, or something that I can that I can read over myself. But I'm, I'm very grateful to, to you for summarizing as much as you can. I think we hit a lot of the big ones there. And uh, it's funny even listening to those those I mean, the first one you mentioned there about the approach anxiety. I mean, I could imagine I could imagine, you know, credible evolutionary psychologists like Jeffrey Miller or someone testing that uh, the future speculative ones. Uh, those those are it's basically a rule of the field to look backward and present, not forward. Um, I mean, there's some some exceptions, but mostly very old. And yeah, that's that's. <laughs> I, 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 this is a, this is again, this is a well that goes deep and I recognize that we won't be able to get into it. I guess, I guess as a final topic and I, I recognize that I've taken a, quite a lot of your morning and, and I've, I've now taken you into your afternoon. So I, if you have to get off, we can, we can totally wrap this up. I'm very happy to discuss with you. Okay. Good, excellent. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to discuss as well. I'm interested uh, as a final kind of point We've talked about these different groups. We've talked about some of their disagreements, some of their agreements. But what would be, and, and maybe this is a, another question that is just too difficult to answer, you know, verbally in a, in a relatively short format such as this. But what are, what are at least the major disagreements between uh, these groups? It, w- it would be great to distinguish the red pill from the... Uh, incels from the mg tau from all these all these people what do they actually disagree on and is there any disagreement that's relevant to our science i would start by stating that men's rights activists as a group are very different from others they are mostly they are not only online based and these people use their real name they are activists they have organizations and they try to lobby governments uh, local governments So, for example, there was even a a Supreme Court case that was initiated by a big men's rights organization and that questioned the military service in the U.S. There is still selective service registration for all U.S. adults, but only if you are a man. So they thought, well, in current society, 
where women have been thoroughly incorporated in the U.S. Army, it, it's very unfair that only men get drafted in the army in case of war, and they want to change that. And as you can see, that's an idea that seems to be quite egalitarian and appealing to contemporary values. So the Supreme Court rejected um, the, um, the case and said that military matters were uh, under the purview of Congress and that Congress was supposed to examine the thing. I'm just using this example to show that this group is more mainstream than the others. Now, in terms of disagreements with the other groups who are, uh, which are mostly online, there are disagreements about strategies. So, for example, both men's rights activists and men going their own way will share the same gloomy assessment on what it means to be a man in contemporary society. They think that marriage is dangerous for men because you're going to get a divorce and you're going to lose your children's custody and you're going to lose half your assets in the divorce. Um, and so they also are wary about false rape allegations. They think that this is a big concern for young men these days that they can just uh, have sex with someone, and then if the woman changes their mind, her mind, she can just accuse them of being rapists. And so they share the same concerns, but they have big disagreements on strategy. Men's rights activists will try to do advocacy, lobbying, to try to win the cultural debates around those issues and also win some legislative battles. And men going their own way, as their name indicates, they just think this is a waste of time. They think that society is gynocentric, that is geared towards women. I explained what is the evolutionary speculation they make behind that. And so they think the only thing for a man to do is to just escape the mating field altogether, to not reproduce, to not engage with women, because if things go awry, you will never have the law on your side. So here it's a big strategic difference, even though they agree on the main premise. And I would say one of the other most notorious um, hatreds be between manosphere communities is that between incels and pickup artists. So one of the key websites of the early incel community was called PUA Hate. So it was even called Pickup Artist Hate. And it started as those young men who had been disappointed by pickup artists and who were very skeptical of those seduction gurus that were selling methods, sometimes with a very high price tag, that promised to those young men that they could basically have sex whenever they wanted with gorgeous women if they just followed the instructions in the manuals. And so there's a deep antagonism between pickup artists and incels because pickup artists are trying to sell you hope. They are selling methods and a self-help type of outlook when they tell those young men, listen, you just have to work on yourself, work on your appearance, when you work on your charisma and confidence. You're just going to have to memorize those few pickup lines and then to apply them in this type of situation and you're going to get romantic success. And incels are trying to sell hopelessness. They are saying the black pill means that, you know, the, there are some strong preferences in women that seem to be hardwired by evolution and if you don't fit those preferences if you're not muscular if you're not a chad as they would say you're, they're not going to give you the time of day so here you can see deep hostility behind those groups even though uh, they could still all be said to belong to the manosphere because they are mostly non-feminist or anti-feminist they are only composed of men and they talk about you know sexuality from a exclusively from a male perspective and focus. Maybe this is me being too too curious from a scholarly perspective, but are do they have any academic style disagreements about theory? Hmm. Well, I think there's a theoretical tension in the manosphere running be between on the one hand more traditional visions of masculinity that is, for example, most notably in the red pill community, there's this idea of becoming an alpha man. That means some very charismatic, independent, self-sufficient, muscular, all-rounded kind of John Wayne character of a man. 
And on the other hand, you have other groups in the manosphere that kind of do not endorse or reject those traditional norms of masculinity. So incels, for example, they say, these norms have made us suffer. We don't fit these norms. We are not muscular. We are not good looking. And we are also hurt by these gender norms. And in the same way, men's rights activists um, talk a lot about male mental health, about how the pressure to perform the male gender role can be, you know, emotionally taxing for men, that men, um, you know, don't cry, don't have maybe as many close friend uh, networks that as women do, are more isolated in, in contemporary society. And so they kind of reject traditional uh, macho gender norms, if you will, because they think they are also responsible for male suffering and incels think the same way. So in a way, yes, you have this, this contradiction, this deep contradiction about masculinity, some going for more of a traditional approach, going back to virilistic type of values and some trying to find or to reinvent masculinity. Now, what's interesting is that they all have this debate and clearly one of the sides sounds more feminist than the other, right? You would think that the people who try to deconstruct or reinvent masculinity sounds more feminist than the traditionalists. And however, they all do this while being strongly anti-feminist. And this has been puzzling scholars. This has been puzzling researchers, social scientists, and they've been trying to put names on this because it would be very convenient if those groups were old school male supremacists. They think men are superior. They advocate for macho values and the submission of women. And there's some of that. But there's also some more elaborate reflections on masculinity where they reject both traditional gender norms, but also feminist uh, worldviews and narratives. And so scholars have called that hybrid masculinities. And they try to maybe explain that, you know, these are rejections that are internalizing the, the former norms, but that are, that are also based on disparaging other groups like women, for example. And... Um, and this is something that, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know how to conclude this point, but that's the point. <laughs> that is fascinating. I'll tell you what, I'm going to be racing to speak to all the masculinity and femininity researchers that uh, are on the same floor as me and my building. I mean, that's um, what a what a peculiar and accurate observation that they have different, there are different views of masculinity within the manosphere, some of which are endorsing traditional views and some of which are hating them for robbing them of uh, their place in society, or at least that, that would be their, their perception. Wow. Okay. And, and, and are there any theoretical disagreements you can think of that would be evolutionary in nature? Well, Men's rights activists have, and men going their own way as well, think that evolution basically wired men as a group, as a whole sex, to care more for women, to be more empathetic for women, to cater towards their needs, to lavish them with praise and attention and resources just in order to reproduce. So they will call that, you know, being a beta and uh, on the other hand, you could think that uh, red pillars agree with that reading to some level, but they also think that you can transcend it by becoming an alpha man. They, they will, for example, take uh, evolutionary hypothesis like the dual mating strategy uh, that says that maybe women have evolved uh, two timelines or two competing types of reproductive agendas where they might secure a stable reproductive partner, but maybe around ovulation when uh, fertility is at its highest, they are also going to try to find better looking partners with uh, quote unquote good genes. And so there's no necessarily a disagreement because all those groups really believe that deep down society along with feminism uh, is very favorable towards women. And that men would naturally be inclined to put women on pedestals and to behave as those beta male providers. 
Now, some think this is inescapable, like the men going their own way, and that even if you want to play the game of being, quote-unquote, an alpha man, they think this is all rubbish. They think you're still putting women on pedestal, you're still playing into their agenda, you're still basically, you're still basically a slave to their sexual um, promise and attractivity. So once again, maybe similar diagnosis, but different takes on this depending on your interests and on how intense some of your beliefs are. So it's different interpretations. It goes back to our earlier discussion of the many different interpretations that you can make with the same set of facts, except in this Absolutely. case, it's not facts. It's, uh, it's kind of fake facts. Oh wow. Okay. Well, this has been this has been a fascinating conversation, and and I've I've taken up I've taken up so much of your day. I guess as a as a just final question to lead us off, and and thank you again for taking the time to come on this show. This has been wonderful and informative, and it puts a lot of things both from you know my public work and past episodes. Uh, it just it, it it adds a lot of context and depth. So I'm really grateful to you for taking the time. What's next? What are you? Uh, where, where are you thinking this? Uh, this ship heads. Are you? Um, are you potentially going to write a, a history of the manosphere, or is it? Uh, is it strictly on assessing their uh, their scientific knowledge? So I'm writing my PhD at the moment. So the dissertation is my final year. So I already have a lot on my plate, and it does feature what I think is, to this day, to my knowledge, maybe the most complete. Uh, historical genealogy and ideological uh, review of manosphere groups and their beliefs. So maybe that could be turned into a book afterwards. However, I have to admit that uh, going forward, maybe I'm going to go to more relaxing areas of research because um, those communities are hostile to researchers. Um, as a rule, they are very defiant of journalists, outsiders, social scientists, and you had William Costello on the show last, uh, last episode, and he kind of exemplified how to get access to those communities, you also have to get to develop a bond of trust with them. They need to be sure that you're not going to be too critical, that you're going to agree with them, because as I said, they are in a very strong anti-establishment narrative. So as a researcher working for a university, you're assumed to be uh, quote-unquote woke, you're assumed to be after them. And uh, since there's been a few terror attacks coming from uh, the manosphere, almost exclusively from incels, but there's also been uh, a case of a shooting uh, of a judge, federal judge by a prominent men's rights lawyer, for example, I had to take some you know precautions around, around safety and cybersecurity. And this has been quite... Uh, an impediment. I mean, it's just uh, the research has been slower because of that. So I'm thinking maybe something um, more tranquil for the future, like, I don't know, a, a sewing club with old ladies knitting or something like that, because uh, this has been uh, this has been quite a, a roller coaster for sure. Oh, uh, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm grateful to you for uh, for doing the work. I look forward to having you on in five years to talk about uh, the uh, evolutionary psychology of uh, women's knitting associations. <laughs> I would love to. That's the show. Thanks again to Louis for coming on. Thank you again to all the donors who make this show possible. As usual, lately, I don't know with everything on my plate when the next episode is going to be released, but I know it's going to be on a different topic. I'm hoping monkeys, maybe. So if you know of any good primatologists, or at least primatologists who are good for a chat, you can recommend them at macandmurphy.org by scrolling down to the bottom and filling out a contact form. Until then, appropriately, have a happy Valentine's Day, and remember to be kind to animals. <laughs>